And so I was really excited to take it. And he comes to my office and his face is that I have a, a partner who takes the rock stuff. And I had another partner who had been the president of the world's largest video game company. So we had a media room and they like had massive speakers and like stereo and video game consoles and TV and all that. And sound so for a moment, I didn't say a word that I was saying that. It was just like that. Dead. Mark looks in. I take one look, and he looks just like Mark <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's got the sandal. He's got the skinny jeans, the t shirt, the hood, the courier hat. He sits down. I sit down. Now we're closer than Alan and I are to each other. And we're in comfy chairs, kind of like this, but we're head on. Maybe our knees are probably a foot far, right? Boom. It's really far. So, Mark, before you say anything, I have to tell you why I'm thinking this man. I was thinking he was 22. So, if it hasn't already happened, either Microsoft or Yahoo is going to offer $1 billion to Facebook. And everybody you know, your parents, or the directors, your management team, your employees, and all your friends are going to say, Mark, Hey, the money! It's a billion dollars. You'll have 650 million bucks. You can change the world. And we'll be rich. And hey, we only got 9 million users and 9 million dollars in revenues. We're nothing. A billion dollars is real money. <laughs> your venture plan will say, oh, I'll back your next stuff and it'll be way better than Facebook. I said, Mark, I know two things that I've learned in the 24 years I've been doing this. One is, there is not one entrepreneur in the history of Silicon Valley. Who never had the perfect idea at the perfect time twice. Not Steve Jobs, not anybody, it's not going to happen to you. This is the perfect idea. You're going to be bigger. If you follow this thing through, you're going to be bigger than Google is today. The second thing I know is I don't care who buys it, whoever buys it, they're going to wreck Facebook. This is your idea, this is your vision. If you believe it, you've got to see it. Now, imagine the scene. Or in his totally head corner. I was just looking at this really heavy two minute trip by the 22 year old I've never met. And I'm expecting some kind of response. Right? The old natural. I'm just giving <laughs> the best advice I've ever had in the whole life. <laughs> Here's what I got. <laughs> at the one minute mark, I'm sitting there saying to myself, Wow, he's really thinking about what I said. <laughs> right? He's like really showing respect. And he's like, I've never had a 20-year-old think this hard about something I did. Right? If I were a parent, I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> At the two-minute mark, I'm going, this is really weird. <laughs> At the three-minute mark, I'm digging trenches in the upholstery of the room. <laughs> At the four-minute mark, it's all I can do not to scream. <laughs> Finally, he visibly relaxed, comes out of the thing, they're close to the rush. You're not going to believe this, but that story you just told, that is why I am here. Exactly what you said has just happened. $1 billion. Yeah, everybody tells me to sell it. I go, well, what do you want to do? Because I want to follow my vision, but everybody else wants to sell. I can't run the company by myself. What do I want to do? I said, Mark, you got 9 million users off from nothing in two years. You got like $12 million on your balance sheet. Everything's going perfect. You got a great idea. You're going to be bigger than Google. If you believe in the idea, you got to go for it. We'll get you some new people, but you just got to go for it. The whole meeting lasted less than half an hour. He sends me an email after and says, Would you mind coming see me in my office? And that began a three year period where I was going to spend first. Because he needs to replace a man. He needs someone who actually believes his vision. And apparently, there weren't that many people I had. So I had to do that. And I had to tell you, Mark was a fantastic person. I really liked him. He had a really bold vision, he really believed in. But obviously, he was an incredible listener, right? And he sought me out on things would be valued by him. And he acted on it, right? And if you've ever been a mentor, you know how powerful it is to have a person who advises you. He's got this 
surgery. And so when the time came and he needed a new number two, I brought in Cheryl Sandberg, who was the person who introduced me to Bob. And why did he use me? And so I was a huge fan. Such a huge fan. That when things came off the rails, I missed signals quite well. All right, let's let's just do five. <laughs> 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 That's fourteen weeks in the book tour. This part of the thing I know how to do. But but so in the, I mean, we all know Facebook and monitoring. All the things that was. But you connect with friends, you yeah. see them decades. It, it, my, my mother connected with my children through Facebook. Well, it, it, the sharing of photographs with an extended family group was a massively positive thing, right? <coughs> and the notion that, you know, when you have family members out of town, the ability to share what was going on is huge. And, uh, and the whole air of spring. And so, when did it start to dawn on you? The uh, this is where I get to make a confession, right? I'm a professional now. There were signals in the early of the town. There was a signal in 2006 saying that nothing which I caught, but I thought we were the best one. Things started to get conservative kind of around 2011, which is two years after I stopped being a mentor. And I retired. I realized that the, the culture of Silicon Valley was And I thought Facebook was going to This would be an interesting to stick out. What happened is Silicon Valley, for the first 50 years, from 56 to about 2000, Twitter or four, was always constrained. You never had enough cost to have a story, memory, or family, which you want to do. So every company had to totally focus on the site and deliver to one thing people would have paid for. Then all of a sudden, Morris Law and Metcalf's Law, which are the laws about processing power networks, all of a sudden the technology caught up with the consumer need. And for the first time in history, you could make a product that was global and you could make a global consumer product, which meant you no longer had to pay attention to the customer. And not only that, because you had enough of everything, that needed economic to create what we now know as Amazon Web Services, the notion of a company that provides. All the infrastructure for a product that you can take over a credit card that never existed before, and that changed everything because suddenly the cost of the store went from 100 million to 10. And when that happened, you wound up getting all of these people coming in with this new business model of I want to build a global monopoly and I'm not going to listen to anybody, I'm going to eliminate all the friction, I'm just going to ignore the law. So you get one set of companies literally begin with law breaking, so this Uber, Lyft, and Airbnb. Their entire premise is based on violating the law. And then you have a whole other set, you know, which are companies that say, wow, there's some people out here who don't have good data. I'm going to take advantage of them. And that's a lot of fintech companies who are left relative to drivers, Spotify, relative to musicians. And I'm sitting there going, I don't like that anymore, but I think Facebook's different. I retired in 2015 because I can't invest money anymore if I'm not going to invest in the best of all that Silicon Valley has to offer, and I'm philosophically close to it. And immediately, a month later, January 2016, I start seeing Facebook through a different set of lenses. <laughs> the first thing I saw was in the New Hampshire primary a Bernie Sanders associated Facebook group spreading really ugly. Names, images with text, combination of misogyny and disinformation, spreading virally in a way that says somebody is spending money to get my friends to join this Facebook group. I'm almost certain it was the Russians. I didn't know that. For this is the end of 2016. Then in March 2016, Facebook expelled the corporation that was using its ad tools to gather data. On people who are interested in Black Lives Matter, and they were selling it to police departments. And the problem with this was that this was the use of the ad tools that was dead easy to do. The tools allow you to sort by any interest and have the data. 
All they were trying to get was names of the people. That's all they needed. And then Facebook did the right thing, but the people were being harassed. Right. But so at what point did you, did you, did the concern go to the point where you felt you had a reset? So Brexit was, Brexit was difficult. So Brexit was, like, oh my God, those same head tools can be used to distort an election because they give this massive advantage to the campaign with a more inflammatory message. I mean, this is just really bad for democracy. So I started looking for friends, but I can't find anyone until Walt Mossberg, who used to be the Wall Street Journal's personal tech manager, he invites me to write a lot for his art, not not bad for his blog, and that's September. And I start writing, and all of a sudden, we get two pieces of news. Housing and redevelopment. The Department of Housing and Redevelopment cites Facebook for ad tools that allow discrimination of tools. The same thing they got sued by. Oh, they got sued over that same issue six weeks ago. But the original case came out in October 26th. And, and I'm going to stop here just for a second because I think this is really important. Up to this point, you have yet to say the word Trump. This had nothing to do with Trump. Nothing. nothing. No, in fact, then the last thing we get is the Russians are interfering in the election. That story breaks mid October. I was, I got to reach out to my friends. I can't write an op ed. I got to go to the market show. I got to warn. Because what I'm saying is that there's something about the physical and the algorithms that's letting bad people that are innocent. You're your mentor, you reach out. So I reach out nine days before the election. I'm not even thinking about the election. I just going, guys, I got two serious cases of civil rights violation. I got two election things, neither of which has to do with the presidential election. I'm freaked out. And they both come back to me within an hour or two. And they go, Roger, we really appreciate you reaching out. But we disagree. We don't think these are, there's anything systemically wrong with the business model of the outcome. We think these are all isolated things, and we've taken care of all, but there's nothing to see here. But we value you as our former mentor. We're going to pass you off to our fixer, Dan Rose, and he'll work with you. So I talked to Dan, and Dan goes, Roger, we're cool. The law says we're a platform, not a media. So we're not responsible for anything third parties do. And I go, Dan, we're talking civil rights and democracy here. Are you sure the law is going to be enough to protect you? We have this conversation two or three times, then the election happens. At which point I freak out completely because we know that the Russians were trying to interfere. We know that from just like three weeks before. If, a, if somebody concludes that Facebook played a role in this, they're dead. And I go through, you've got to do what Johnson and Johnson did in 1982 after that guy was poisoned and got us Right? And what he did, he didn't wait for somebody to tell him to do something. He pulled every bottle off of every retail shelf and didn't put it back until they invented campus and packaging. His immediate instinct was to defend the people who used the product. And I said, Dan, that's what Facebook's got to do. You've got to work with the investigators. You've got to voluntarily do this to protect everybody. You've got to protect everybody. You've got to trust them. So why do you think they were so invested in this notion that they're a platform and therefore don't have any responsibility? Well, it's really convenient. I was giving her a Well, it doesn't just avoid liability. It basically says you can, it says you can disrupt the world and not be accountable. Not your problem. Not your problem. I mean, you know, if you're a young entrepreneur and you're making a billion dollars a week, <laughs> take every advantage you can get. And I mean, I think we live in a culture today where business has lost sight of the big picture. Right? We've been told for 30 years that the only constituency that matters is shareholders. And we've been told for 30 years that the government is the problem. And demonstrably, in capitalism, if you go back to say the neutral capitalist theory, the role of government is to set the rules and then enforce them equally. And folks my age, folks your age, can remember a guy named Peter Drucker, who was the management guru of the latter half of the industrial age. He used to talk about the five stakeholders shareholders, employees, the communities where employees work. Customers and suppliers. And you had to balance everybody. 
And in the end, if you did that, you'd have peace and harmony. And these guys were all operating in a world now where there were no rules, where nobody expected you to look out for anybody but number one. But I think we should invite that, or ask the Grand Library to have us back and have that conversation as a second conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do some Facebook conversation. But this is the world they're in. This is the world they're in. I spent three months, three months pleading with them to do the right thing. But, the, but eventually, they, they rejected that at that time. But eventually, they got pounded over the head enough that they said, well, I guess we've got this. Oh no, I know that's not what's going on at all. No, I think they're completely no no. I think what's going on is that they are defining a classic strategic retreat where they're conceding things that don't matter, that appear to be politically salient enough that maybe they'll make people go away and stop them. Away. And you know, the issues here run to the core business model. And and this is what I learned in early 2017. Which is, I had a good understanding of Facebook's business model, but not all the psychology. The way it works is they are, well, they, no matter what they tell you, they are media companies. They have to compete against other media. They compete against Netflix, they compete against video games, television, radio, magazines, everything else. They have to get your attention. How do they do that? They have an advantage that no broadcast media has ever had. On a smartphone, you can target the Right? It's a giant. And they do it with the notifications. They appeal to the most basic human needs. First, the need for rewards. They do that with notifications, which come in at random times and say, hey, 27 people like your post. Or, please join my network on LinkedIn. <laughs> or, hey, you can tag in a photograph. Which those things then stimulate two other things, which is their need for social. Approval. I wow, what a life. I've been invited to join them. And then your need for social responsibility, which is wow, they like me, I better like something of theirs, or I better join their network, or I better tag somebody else, right? That builds a habit. But on a smartphone, you're checking the thing every free moment, right? And then the question is, does that become a behavioral addiction? So here's the test. When do you check your smartphone first thing in the morning? Is it before you pee? <laughs> or while you're peeing? Because <laughs> pretty much everybody is in that way, right? <laughs> okay? So we're all addicted to one degree or another. So then they got to get us to spend time. And here's where it gets scary, and here's where it screws up democracy. It turns out if you want to get people to spend a lot of time on a smartphone based thing, you want to appeal to flight or fight. You want to get at those lizard brain emotions that are common to all of us fear and hunger. It turns out that these guys have been able to build business models based on something called behavioral prediction. Now, they're not just doing advertising. We think what we're doing is we're giving them a little data they target ads. They're way past that. Okay? They're now in this business of creating data, voodoo dolls, understanding your behavior. They get data from absolutely everywhere. They know more about you than you can possibly believe. And they're selling certain people. And the way they get that best is they pierce the rim, that public person that you are when you come here. You get to the person you are when there's nobody looking. And it turns out that fear and outrage, people react totally differently. The things that are fearful or outrageous, but they react in ways that are true to themselves. So, Reg, you make this sound so malicious. <laughs> but, I mean, people don't have to click on it. They don't have to be on Facebook. They don't have to click on it. No, no, that's right. But enough people do, right? 70% of us do, okay? And so, and we must get some more No, we do. We get lots of rewards. But what I'm saying now, here's the key point to recognize is that it's not like every post. Has to stimulate fear out. They just have to have enough in there so that they know how you react to it. Okay? And so here's why it matters. We have a huge problem with hate speech today. We have a huge problem with disinformation. We have a huge problem with conspiracy theory. Right? See, the thing with these guys, because they have all this data about us, each one of us has our own channel, our own truing channel, right? Where they're reinforcing the things you react to most. And maybe that's all photos of puppies. Right? <laughs> but for 70% of us, it's going to be something that gets you pissed off. 
right? Something political or something religious or something, whatever. Whatever the thing is that gets to you and gets you in that mood. And the, that is incredibly divisive. And that's why it's so hard. The, the scariest manifestation of that I've seen in these stories about what happened in Myanmar. Right. So if you guys know about Myanmar, this is a country of 50 million people in Asia, formerly known as Burma. Right? That's the Thailand. There, Facebook made it one of the countries that got Facebook free basis. They had no telecommunications, no mass media. The first thing that they had was Facebook. Facebook went in, did a deal with the government, they cut the price of data on cell phones to a really low level. Facebook subsidized it. They had a monopoly. And in this country with no history of media, no history of telecommunications, suddenly you have Facebook. And the lead generals in the land and the heads of Buddhism got together and decided to do an ethnic cleansing of a religious minority called the Roman. So they went and they used Facebook to broadcast hate speech. 9,000 people were confirmed dead, 42,000 people were missing and presumed dead in six months. And Facebook did not. Well, the United Nations looked at this and said that this entire thing was enabled and made possible by Facebook. And then Facebook did not. And here we are two years later. Here we are two years later. Not one person on Facebook has stood up and said they got a problem. I find that deep. what Facebook what Facebook has done is hire thousands and thousands and thousands of on to have to take responsibility for the stuff they put out. No, they hired all these they hired all these monitors whose job is to take stuff back. So let's let's walk through how this works. So the core issue, they the hate speech doesn't need to stay up to be effective. But it needs to go into the system to be effective. So Facebook's first order strategy was to say, we'll let all the users police the content. When things went wrong, they said, okay, we're going to invest heavily in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence worked moderately well against everything but hate speech. Well, that for the of hate speech. So then they started to hire moderators, where people paid a minimum wage mostly in the Philippines. So really low prices. They were temps, they were not full-time employees. And their job was to go through and look at this stuff after it had already gone in the system and after the problem had been done. You can't solve this problem at this scale. Mathematically, it does not work. You have to prevent the stuff from going in the first place. Here's the way to find that. This is not an issue of censorship. I don't have a problem with people posting whatever it is they believe. The problem is that Facebook's algorithms, because of the business model works the way it does, the algorithms promote the most engaging content disproportionately. And that is disproportionately hate speech, conspiracy theories, and disinformation. We have to get them to stop amplifying hate speech, conspiracy theories, and disinformation. And the only way to do that is to change their business model, which they will not do without So, so I, I want to get to I want to get to the fix in a minute, but you know Mark Zuckerberg and Sarah Sanders well, which think you're working with them to introduce them. They back me? No. So how can if they how can they be responsible for what they're talking about? Well they, they, we're talking about two different things. So what I would say here is that the culture of Silicon Valley is Rotten. That for all intents and purposes, it is exploitative in the sense that, well, let me back up. I mean, I'm going to use Google's example. I'm going to borrow from a dear friend of mine, Professor Shoshana Zubakar Carter. She makes the point if Google believes that the world is full of inefficiency and misery, in all of which can be relieved if only Google can convert all human experience, everything about our lives, everything that we into data, and then process it through their uh, computer systems, various machine learning and artificial intelligence systems. And then they would take products, and they would just organize everything to take all the stress. So you think about Google Maps, right? 
It predicts where you're going to go. Well, have you thought about how that was going on there? Okay, go to those 49. Right? That sentence said, We are responsible for allocating cars on the highway. So they do something they call road balancing, which is they send some people off on known and clear routes to keep things moving smoothly. Right? You ever been the person who's been sent off the road? Something I should get used to, right? I mean, so that. My point to you here is that these aren't bad people, but they have a philosophy that runs literally contrary to the founding principles of the United States of America. We come out of the philosophy of the, the notion that we are each entitled to self determination, that we have free will, and that, in fact, uncertainty, the thing they're trying to get rid of, is the basis for choice, which is what makes us individual. And so, what's wrong here is this is not a question of their of them being good or bad people. They have an operational philosophy that in a world without rules, they simply did. So what do you what do you do about it? I mean, oh, I, I, I want to have a conversation. And my whole point here is that maybe the country will decide that's the way it wants to live. But right now, until I said that, you did not know that was how it worked. And I think we need to have a conversation of do we want Google and Facebook to be determining the choices in our lives? Because here's how it works, right? They, you know, it started with Google. This is again Professor Zubov. It starts in 2002 with search, and they realized, you know what? There's something cool going on. The search tells us about purchasing that. You go on vacation, you go and look for a hotel at your first home. But they looked at the data they were getting, and it said something much bigger was out there. They could predict human behavior. So they realized they need to find out who people were, where they lived, and all that. So they did Gmail. Uh, anybody here use Gmail? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Gmail, you kind of get it, you purchase it, and it's good for everyone, right? Because the advertiser will pay much more if they know who they're selling to. Google gets paid more, and you get a better targeted ad. But Google goes, wait a we're now in the behavioral prediction business. If we want to know what people are going to do, what the source of information we have, we need to read their emails. The problem is, Google says, we're a platform, right? Which means they're a common carrier. Well, that's like a phone company, a postal service. If they read the contents of stuff going through their head, they go to jail. So Google's got to find a way around that. They say, oh, we'll make it a free service, we'll put it in. We'll just scan your emails to part of the ads. Now you hated the ads, so they pulled the ads out, but they're still reading your email. So they can find out what you're thinking. They make a better day to do Then they do maps, I told you what goes on there. Then they want out and start driving up and down the street with a camera on top of the car. <laughs> they call it Street View, right? They picture how it's hard to go. And they say, We own this. This is ours now. Your human experience is on Some of you do this now. Then Google Glass, where right in your face, right? What's Google Glass? This is a place where the purpose of the person wearing Google Glass is different from Google. The person wearing it wants to look like a dart. <laughs> where Google wants to take facial recognition of everybody's seen and track their movement in real time. It fails. So they go back into the lab and repackage it. And they spin it out as a separate company called Niantic. Is called Pokemon Zone. And <laughs> One billion people are going around recording our right. facial all right. algorithm. <laughs> <laughs> the Soviet view of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I am really telling you what's going on. I'm going to have to give you 30 seconds. They're going around and they're taking pictures of everybody. Right? And then they also get all their movements and they start running behavioral modification. If we put a Pokemon on private property, will you knock on a stranger? We will. If we put it over a fence, will you climb the fence? If we if you would deal with Starbucks, if put a Pokemon on a Starbucks, will you buy a car? You will. My point to you here is they have this data in the dollar, and they control the menu of your choices because Every time you're going to buy something, every time you're going to look up a medical thing, okay. every time you're going to look up a medical thing, every time you're going to look up a medical thing, stop here for a second. I, I, I understand what you're saying about the, uh, the data prediction. 
There's clearly a lot of that data is used to provide value to us and the user. Google Maps actually has a lot of value of course. to me. Uh, uh, Netflix by being able to well, I'm just saying Netflix is a different animal. I like this. And the thing to understand is Netflix is not changing the outcomes of elections. Yeah. Netflix is okay. not invading your personal space. They're not affecting your children from mental health. Yeah, so my, my, my question is, is this. How do we fix the downsides without taking away the advantage? So the advantage is just so we're clear. With respect to Google, there are substitutes for everything Google does. There's literally nothing you would lose. Like, if Google disappeared tomorrow, there's nothing you would lose. And every engineer person I'm talking thinks that we could replace every functional thing in Facebook in three weeks just can't be started. And we already know we're doing in three weeks. This is not complicated. You're not being asked to give up anything. What I'm talking about is taking away from them the part of their lives, the part of their business that is manipulating people's lives. So how do you do that? I think you have to take away this whole data surveillance monetization strategy. So the way to think about this is, I want to ban web tracking. I want to ban the scanning of emails and documents. I want to ban uh, the purchase and use of third-party data. So they go to your bank, they go to your credit card processor, they go to your credit rating agency, they get every financial thing about you that you possibly know. They go to your cell phone company and get your location by the minute all day long. They go to every web app out there and buy all the data that's there, health and wellness data, real estate, every single thing that's out there. These data voodoo dolls are something that I just don't believe should be allowed to exist. I think they have too much damage to democracy, privacy, public health, and, uh, and competition. And then the other thing I'd like okay, to so what? So you're saying you can't purchase data? No, I can't collect data. Can't either can't collect, can't purchase. Can't collect any data. No, you can. First party data is fine. You can't collect data and then use it for any any activity other than that you collected. So if you're doing it to in that, to improve search, no, that is okay. No, yes, for search that's okay. And if you're using Uber, you can give your location to Uber. It's just the right now. Netflix can collect your data right. in order to improve right. their, their offerings. Right. It, it, you it, can't it, use it for things you didn't know about. Exactly. Exactly. I want the I want the business to be honest. Yeah. As opposed to dishonest. This is the second thing I want to do. I want to use a little bit of any trust because I want to create space. Right now, startups can't get going because these guys have too much intellectual property control. They have too much uh, they have too much cross subsidy in their businesses, and they have uh, patent cross licenses. They have all these things. Chris Hughes says force them to sell off. Instagram. Yeah, we, yes, but you have to do much more than that because you actually, what I like to do is two things. I'd like to do what we did in 18 and 1956, which is to take the patent portfolios and put them out for free license to any American startup. And then secondly, I like to do what we did with AT&T relative to uh, long distance when we created Sprint and MCI. I'd like to have it be required that a startup with a good business model to have access to grow audience using Facebook. There, there's one Catching your plan tonight is that you have to have smart regulators and legislators. <laughs> <laughs> you do that? Well, so here's the key thing. Until the fall of 2017, no one in Washington, no one in any other in the entire world thought there was a need for the federal None of us thought there was a need. We all trusted them. And it turned out we got taken advantage. So they're spinning up very rapidly. I'm working today with the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. I'm working with the Federal Trade Commission. I'm working with a lot of members of the House and Senate. I'm beginning to work with the governments outside the United States. And everybody's getting up to speed. It's not going to happen all the time. But they're doing their best. Where it has to start is with all of us. We have to, we have a campaign about, you know, it's just picking up right now for 2020. This is not a partisan issue. This is not about left and right. This is about right and wrong. And when I go on, I'll be on Fox and Friends tomorrow morning, 
I'll be on the public and I'll send these to you later in the week. This is not partisan. Everybody gets it. When you meet a politician, you ask them, why is Google allowed to read my email? Why is anybody allowed to trade my personal financial data or my location data or anything else? Why are they even allowed to hold data about the money? Why is that legal? I mean, Chromebooks and schools are there to collect data about little kids. When they're supposed to be learning to focus on the teacher, learning to socialize with the classroom, they're being forced to use computers in class. You think this is going to happen? I'm going to try my best. Mm-hmm. I, I'll, I'll tell you a study, statistic, price was nice enough to mention the uh, the uh, daily uh, email I write. Right. I, I mentioned this in this morning, but we're at Fortune we're in the field with a, our annual survey of Fortune 500 CEOs. Uh, uh, and one of the questions we asked them was, would you these companies, you could need additional regulation? 50% of Fortune 500 CEOs, these are not people who like regulation, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, other answer, 50% now say Facebook needs additional regulation. Yeah. I think, I we're making progress. I mean, two years ago, there was no need for the process. Six months ago, I could get five people in a row. <laughs> and this is a completely standard audience for this tour. And I've been with it seven days a week and four days. And I just want to thank you all for coming out because it's, you know, this is our lives, right? This is our democracy, our country. And my point is, if you're a GP or disagree with me, it doesn't matter. I just want to have a debate about this. Well, we'll do what I'm going to uh, take some comments from the audience, but before I do that, have you had any contact with Parker Sherrill? No. Since 2016? No. Since, uh, and no, with no one from Facebook. Well, you must be driving the nuts. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, in, in, in fairness, I think, I think it's more likely that they're wondering. I you know, I gave you really, really good advice that they follow this one. This is going to happen. So, I, I mean, if I'm driving them nuts, it's because they still have to learn. Um, yeah, I think that this is a very simple thing that Mark and Larry and Sergey at Google are one of the things to take away from the business. But they can do more good by changing the business policy of some of their families. They can do it on hundreds of channels other for any ship or any other kind of thing. This is their opportunity. Heroes in their own story. I would love to help them get there. I mean, if you, if you don't see any sign of movement, that's not right. this whole no. privacy. I no, don't see that's just all the privacy. No. It's all, it's all of that is uh-huh. public relations. And it's really, by the way, really good public relations. I really think I had to mark in particular. The Google pretend like this has nothing to do with them, which is not that well. But Mark's actually engaged in the conversation for which I give the most credit. I mean, having known him, it, it was unimaginable two years ago to see him here where he's doing now. And I know it must hurt him. And I'm proud of him. And I hope he gets the whole life. You're proud of him. You say he's not addressing crime. No, but he's engaging in the conversation. No, he's, he's doing what his board of directors or what any investor would want him to do, which is to concede nothing important. He's right? Playing he's playing defense. And, and you know, he, he's not going to win, but at least he's in the game. As and opposed to the forward, just kind of. Where are you? Yeah, and it was just getting worse and worse and worse geometrically. I mean, Alan, he had you believe that maybe he was making progress, and I'll bet there are a lot of people who believe that because it sounds sincere. But it, it doesn't address the real uh, questions. Yes. The ladies first, if you don't. Would you mind, sir? Yes. Just start with a little bit. I have a simple policy on that. I always like to start with a little bit. It's a bad before we get things right back there, I get to do this. I get to do this. <laughs> so my question is, uh, you know, if Google and Facebook change their policies, isn't the technology, aren't the algorithms, algorithms already out there so that China's still going to take the end of all this? Oh, great, great question. So the, I'm, going to, I'm going to frame the question as to how does this relate to China? And because Google would sit there and say, you can't regulate us because the country depends on us to compete against China in artificial intelligence. Is that a reasonable way of reframing the question? Okay, so here's the problem with that logic. China has a country where the tech companies work for the government, and they have a program called Social Credit. It is a behavioral manipulation program designed to produce in the population uh, actions that are desirable for the state. <laughs> Google is correct that its primary competitor is China. Because Google, 
Facebook, and now Amazon and Microsoft are engaged in behavioral manipulation. Now, my question is, we're in the United States of America. Why in God's name do we want to compete with China in behavioral manipulation? Since when is that a good American thing to do? I mean, there are literally a million great things you can do with, with, with AI that don't require behavioral manipulation. And so what I'd really like to see us do is to recognize that behavioral manipulation is like cloning human babies or making time to release anthrax. It's one of those things you don't have to do. Well, maybe. But why do you think that American AI will control the Right, but AI and behavioral manipulation are not the same thing. So you can ask the one without doing the other. Of course. Yes, sir. That was actually a question. Oh, good. <laughs> now we can ask, yes, please. So my question is, why um, could you form like a 501 c 3 or some sort of organization that people could get involved with to uh, come along with your cause? Thank you. She asked, could I form a 501c3 or something so people could come along with your cause? This is something I should have done in the beginning. If I'd known the first thing about activism, that's what exactly what I would have done. My partner, Tristan Harris, has started a thing called the Center for Humane Technology. Humane Technology. Now, their focus is a narrower subset of the whole. And I'm working on what is important. They started from the addiction hypothesis in computer design. I am looking to try to create one now with Shoshana Zubov and some other people aimed at the broader problem. Here's the core point of it. You do not need to wait for us. My book provides you with a lot of guidance for how to do activism in this area. And I think for anyone who has a bit of you have to buy your Any of you who needs it, I will buy you. <laughs> now, but you okay, have one taker, right? Okay. Okay. So, uh, but to go back on this thing, I think the kid thing, if you have kids in elementary school or in higher high school, this is really, really, really important, and I'll explain why. So the difference between adolescents, I've learned, and adulthood is that adolescents, kids, see themselves in the reflection of their friend group, right? So it's all about the approval of people around you. In adulthood, we start to see ourselves as a separate unit, and the friends are just an important part of our lives. And apparently, these products are interrupting that transition. It's one of the driving factors of 25 and 30 year old kids still live in their home and still, right? I mean, we've all seen this. And so, one of the things that the problem here is the way these products are designed is having a really material effect on our kids. And there's some great resources that I point you to in the book. And there's a book I've called The Little Kids by Nicholas Tartarus. You don't need to read my book, but I'm not that. One called uh, Irresistible by Adam Alter. Those are two great places to start to learn how, how to protect your kids. Super, super important. Uh, uh, right there, and then uh, in the back, you guys are going to throw one. Is there any risk that the tech companies use their behavior a lot to defend themselves? Meaning that they influence selections, either the outcomes they want, or something else in a great way. So, questions Is there any risk that the tech companies will use their power, their behavior manipulation to protect themselves? So, the natural thing, these companies, their products are ubiquitous, and if your product is ubiquitous, you must align your power. And in an environment where they're under pressure, there's a real risk that one side chooses to align with them. This is the thing George Soros gave his big speech about Davos a year ago, about this great fear of authoritarians aligning with these companies for their mutual self-interest. I mean, I think there is a real risk. I, mean, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, right. um, isn't it one of the solutions to a lot of these social media companies that dual class voting? And we're in an age of index investing. And a lot of the indexes, recently, they one of them said that they weren't going to include dual class voting companies. And you have companies that are minority owned with majority <coughs> vote. Isn't that one of the ways that you can say, hey, you have all this voting control. You don't, you're not giving the outside, you know, 
Yeah. It's it's taking months for them. I'd be curious about Alan's perspective. My perspective is that shareholders are really happy with Google and Facebook right now and not at all concerned about the founders' disproportionate voting share. Uh, I do think, as a generalization from a policy point of view, that having the disproportionate voting power of the founders is actually a bad thing. Uh, but that's not correct. But there is this sense that you you have it in your book. There's in the Chris Hughes piece this sense that part of the problem here is that Zuckerberg just has too much power and no one has any he doesn't report any money. No one has any say. Doesn't have to pay attention to any money. Right? He has complete voting power over the government. That's true of Google too. And that I mean it's a huge problem. And there is currently a fix to it, right? Which is why I think public pressure comes. I mean, if you look at Facebook. You know, while the, the user counts held level, the usage is down like 20% really from its high. Right? So people have changed their behavior. And you saw the 2018 election. I want to give you a set of things that make me feel really positive. So the 2018 election, the three groups that were most heavily suppressed in 2016, which were suburban white women, people of color, and idealistic young people, they all turned out in unbelievably high rates of 2018. And then in the past year, you've seen like 60 successful teacher labor actions in the United States, up from like that was like the number of prior, I don't know, maybe prior decade. And you had the stop and shop uh, strike, which was also successful. And those are all things you would never have seen before. You had the, the March for Our Lives, young kids creating a political movement. These are all changes that suggest higher levels of civic engagement and a greater awareness of the need to restore balance. In the system we have it. And I don't know where that leads, but it gives me great hope. Now you're starting to sound really good. I'm sorry. <laughs> there was a question. Yes, right, yes, right here in the third. Um, if you have a platform that um if you have a platform that allows you to control where your data will go, full transparency, do you are do you are compliant first party data um with only the data that they use essentially? Um and on top of that um, offer the cost of the consumer the ability to monetize your data, their personal data. Um, do you think that is potential? There, there are a couple of records of that. Are you involved with one of them? Or are you? I am. Yeah, <laughs> so, <just answer. laughs> so the question is okay, in Europe they have a thing called the Global Data Protection Regulation, which is about giving you ownership of the data you put in the system and the ability to control what happens to it. And and if you combine that with a system that allows you to profit from your data, would that be enough? And my answer, with all due respect, is I want to go further than that. I want to go to a thing that looks more like distributed identity, where I have absolute control over what people can know about me. I don't, the problem with global data protection regulations is it concedes to Google, Facebook, Amazon, and uh, Microsoft the ability to surveillance, use surveillance to gather data about us. And I think that's wrong. So I want to stop that part. Because the problem here is not that we're not getting paid for our data, although that is bad. The problem is that the data that's being there profiting from today isn't the data they're getting from us, right? Most of the value they're getting is getting person X's data and applying it to person Y. And that's like 99% of what's going on. And none of that is covered by any regulations or enforcement. And you can get there from where you guys are working, but that's not where things are today. We have to start with this a way to give people control of who can see their data in the first place. And there they need legal help because all these companies like banks, credit card processors, you know, CDS of all the data they write, we own this data, we touch it, and we can sell it to anybody we like. And that's kind of something. What can I do? No one? We have one. And by the way, I'm going to sign books afterwards, and I will take any questions you have while I'm signing books. Uh, I'm going to ask them the answer to all questions. Why aren't you advocating all of us to turn off our data? So now would be the clearest place to send the message to So why am I not advocating turning it off? Because it's taking me a hit the first. I'm selling a book to people who are on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to reach those people, and my band is on there. I always, realistically, if for a year I was preaching that, I pulled myself away back and all that. I'm not sure how big a difference that is. In the end, final analysis, we're going to need that eventually, but we ought to have a place to land first. We ought to have a place to create a product. And 
give us some place to go. Um, but it, it, this is hard. I think politics is the best way to do this in the short run. Whenever a candidate comes in here, you get in their face and you say to them, I want you to pass laws that prohibit people from doing commerce on my data. And I want to pass laws that use antitrust to create competitors to these business models. That would be super helpful. Now, I want to thank all of you for coming out today. You have, when you realize you're not, you've taken an enormous risk. Because Facebook and Google know you're here. <laughs>